Welcome to On the Edge with April Mahoney Brains. Here, this is the spot. Where the conversation is pointed, the guests are sharp, and the responses are never dull. Welcome home, Brains. There's only one requirement to hang out on the edge, is that you open your big brain and close your small mind. Did you bring your thinking caps? It's time to put them on, because the conversation starts now. Brains, welcome home on the edge with April Mahoney and my guest today, the beautiful author Annie Moose. She sent me a copy of these two amazing books of hers. This one, House of Fragile Dreams and Arkansas Summer, Love and Terror in the Jim Crow South. We're going to talk to her about these. What was her motivation and inspiration for writing? What is her writing process? What is her uh, emotional attachment to social justice and injustice? Uh, The injustice that she's seen and some of her her, uh, civil rights things that she's experienced in her lifetime. And we're going to get a reading. She's going to read an excerpt. So I'm so excited to have her. She said she was nervous, Brains. I told her she at home ain't no need to be nervous. We're going to treat her like a queen. Thank you so much for joining me, Annie. Welcome on the edge. Thank you so much for having me. So, again, let's begin with your humble beginnings. How, where are you from? And why is this genre important to you and this message important to you in your writing? So I grew up in Sacramento, California, and um, I was born in 1957, so... I was a small child during what you might call the the heyday of the civil rights movement. And in my household, my parents talked a lot about what was going on in the world. We watched the news and uh, it was sort of sacrosanct in my house, uh, be quiet while the news is on. And I just remember vividly, you know, the black and white pictures, a lot of us who grew up in my generation remember of seeing like, you know, black people being, you know, set on with dogs and in the civil rights marches. And, um, and I was just keenly aware as a very, very small child of, of the civil rights battles that were going on. And I knew that people were fighting for their freedom. And it just so happened that my own father, his father was from the South. My dad grew up in California. His father had been a border guard uh, in, uh, in Southern California, but he, they were from the South. And so mm. um, after my grandparents retired, my, they moved back to Arkansas. And um, we used to go to Arkansas for summer vacations when I was really small. And one summer when we were um, visiting and I was about maybe six years old, my parents got in a really horrible fight with my grandfather who was famously a racist. And, um, and my, my grandfather disowned my family over a civil rights fight. So here he had his only son who was a lawyer in California, had four kids. Um, he basically, sent us packing, never spoke to my parents again, forbade my grandmother from having any kind of contact with, with our family. Although I guess my dad did, did talk to her on the phone from time to time. But civil rights is basically broke up my father's, um, my, you know, estranged my father from his family. And so I was aware of that. I was aware that I heard about the civil rights movement a lot. And I kind of, it was kind of baked into me. And I really, grew up believing and sort of seeing the world as like there were good guys and bad guys and it was kind of along racial lines because that was just such a prominent thing going on at the time well it, you really know what it's still, part of me yeah but you know what it's still going on and it's such a waste of time it it's is such a waste on. of time because you don't know what you don't know two things one uh the civil rights i remember that uh, i don't know if you remember the watts riots right but i was trampled in that as a child, and I'm still kind of traumatized when I go into large crowds. We're there, we're waiting for Stevie Wonder and all the performers to come up on the stage. We there, you know, and Watts, and we about to have a good time, barbecued, had on a new outfit. And just out of nowhere, tear gas, billy clubs, people running, people screaming. And I, I had no idea. And then I lost my mother's hand. Oh my gosh. And I got trampled. Well, mama came back and got me. Uh, so I understand what that is about firsthand. And look at me. I'm a black woman. Native American roots, but a black woman. So I am subjected to this all the time. But you know what? I'm not going to be an angry black woman. 
I'm going to be a strategic black woman. I was talking to one of my guests yesterday from Australia. And I asked her, you know, they, they're, they're doing a certain project. And I said, you know, you want to bring in minorities. You want to bring in people from the fold because there's not a lot of black Americans down in Australia. And I said, white people, and girl, her whole body just, I could see it on the screen. Her face turned. She just got all tight. It is what it is. That's not a dirty word. Well, I think it's really important for black people and white people to be able to talk. And I think that, you know, if I have anything that can be said about my life and what I maybe bring to, to the books that I write is that, you know, I've spent my whole life kind of being more, you know, up close and personal with black people than, than a lot of people who are white. And I've talked about race with people. And I think that when, you know, from my experience, when you talk to black people about race, they, they really appreciate it. They really react to that because I think a lot of white people are extremely uncomfortable about talking about it. But I've been talking about it my oh, whole well. life and especially in college when I've had you know, more contact with, you know, arguably with, with black people, more closer relationships. And it just became something that I was just very interested in writing about and, and reaching out to people about because I think- Well, it's strange. It's very important. Yeah, well, when we had 45 in the house, you know, he was an equal opportunity hater. He hated on everybody. <laughs> so, uh, but people just got really, they drew the line. You know, blacks versus whites. We don't have any choice. And this is not just in the United States. This is all around the world. If your skin is darker, you got more melanin in your skin, it seems like you have a harder time. I don't know why people are wasting time with that when we've got climate change, we've got COVID, we've got uh, mental health issues, our economy is going to hell in a handbag. There's so many more important things to talk about or to separate us uh, than the color of our skin. So now you have decided to write a book. What was the inspiration for writing a book? So... Um, I've done, I've read a lot of black literature my whole life. And I happened to be reading this one book called uh, Devil in the Grove by Gilbert White, which is about this really horrible um, case in the South, in, in Florida, in the, in the 40s, where four uh, young black men were accused of raping a white woman. It was complete bullshit, but um, it was a pretty big case. And um, Thurgood Marshall ended up being a lawyer involved in it. Now I was reading this book and I happened to be visiting my parents in Sacramento. And I remember I was sitting in this room with my parents and um, I was thinking about this thing and, and realizing that they were actually, you know, they experienced what it was like to be in the South during the whole Jim Crow era. Um, and I started thinking, you know, wh what was it like being there? So I asked my parents, like, how did that feel bearing witness to, to the, you know, whites only, all that kind of stuff when they were visiting my grandparents in the South? And my parents, um, each of them told me different things about, about things that sort of horrified them when they were there. I remember my mom talked about being in a store um, and, and having the, the checker tell her to come up in front of a black person who was there and head of her. And my mom was like, forget it, no way, I'm not gonna do that. Um, and so, so as my parents were telling me these stories, it occurred to me like, wow, you know, it would be very interesting for me to try to write something that would show the world and how that would look through the eyes of somebody like me, somebody going into the South with the sensibilities that I have or that my mother had. So that was my, where I first had the idea for a story. And I decided to use the, um, the kernel of what had happened to my father's and his father as kind of a starting point. So I, I imagined a story in which a father and, um, his, and his parents were estranged over, you know, over something that happened in the South one summer. And and I invented a little a, a college student who had never been back to the South uh, since she was nine years old, going back to, to Arkansas with her father after the grandfather died. So while she's there, she happens to be reunited with this with this young man who she played with as a child, which you know when she was visiting her grandparents. Um, and I actually got that idea from from Jimmy Carter because he talked about growing up in the South and how like the kids could play together, like if everything was segregated once she became older, but the kids were allowed to run around together. So I well, you know what, and this is the, this is the deal: hurt people, hurt people, and ignorance and trauma is epigenetics. What do you think, or do you have any idea of what your papa went through? Because he didn't just wake up one morning and say, "Oh, you know what? I don't like them niggas over there. I'm gonna spend my life." tormenting them 
You're talking about my grandfather now? Yeah, your grandfather. What do you think might have yeah. happened to him? It's they just that's what they just teach it to people there. Like the, in the South, I mean, I'm not talking about now because I don't have any experience, but you know, I've done a lot of research and, and talked to my parents and other people who grew up in the South. And it was just like served up like with their grits, you know, it was just you, you know, you look down on black people. And you know, I asked my dad once, like, why did my grandfather, what did he have against black people? Why was he like that? And my my dad told me, no black person ever did anything to my father. It was just the way people were taught. Mm -hmm. And you know, when I was researching this book and when I was talking to people about it, it was like there, it was obvious that black people were considered, you know, by white people, this was what they were taught, is that they were just practically less than human that they were to be treated like children they were to be you know they were they were treated worse than dogs in a lot of cases i mean it was oh, just of course. They, it was the way dogs. people were taught and you know that's why i mean we need to teach people differently we need to teach well we do but different. you know now racism is still very prevalent but it, it they try to be overt you know they try to be smart you can't be snarky with me because i'll call you out on it i'm not gonna argue with you i'm not gonna fight you don't have to like me but you're not gonna mess with me you know, and everybody, I'm going to call you all out. Everybody has a tinge or a taste of racism. I don't care if it's black or white, gay, or old, young, transgender, whatever it is. Everybody has a tinge of racism because that's ignorance. And, you know, you quickly have a defense against something that you don't know about, that you don't have an experience with. So you want to judge it, you want to label it, you want to hate it. And, you know, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Well, people should be called out, but I also think that it's really important to, you know, to try to, you know, just to educate people. And I think the more that we become integrated and the more that, you know, uh, people get to know one another, then, you know, you let these things drop away. But unfortunately, too many of us have all these impressions that are given to us, you know, from the media or from, you know, think, uh, uh, our parents or whatever it is that give us a, you know, ideas that are not based on reality. They're not based on experience, but they're just based on these, these, you know, ideas that have been unfortunately in our country for, you know, since its beginnings. And we need to try to figure out how to break it down. But that's part of the reason why I like to write these things, because I write, I write about, about these, I write with these with great affection for black people in my stories. And I think telling the stories between about a man, men and man and a woman, who fall in love, that's one of the ways that all of us can relate to. And it's kind of one of the best ways for things to break down is when, is when people fall in love. You know, and there's, uh, there's a difference there because <clears throat> I know during all the upheaval that was going on with the Black Lives Matters, <laughs> my friends would call me and they say, I don't know what to do. I, I, you know, my white friends, I don't know what to say. Uh, you know, I, I can use my white privilege. I said, baby, it's not a visa card. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something you can just whip out and do that. I don't believe in white privilege. I don't think anybody has privilege. I think privilege is something that's earned. So it's not good. I also looked at the, the recent uh, Aubrey case of those three white men that chased down and lynched literally that young black guy and how strategic the white uh, prosecutor was because it was a, a predominantly all-white jury of women. And for some reason, the media grabbed hold to that and just automatically knew that these guys were, you know, they were going to be exonerated. You know, the district attorney didn't want to prosecute them. And what happened? They convicted them and gave them life plus 20 years. So don't tell me that people, because of the color of their skin, don't know right from wrong. You know, I mean, people were shocked that they actually had that verdict. I mean, in our country... I was, I was so happy. I was so happy. I, I really was. I was really happy because, again, she was strategic. If you use your mind over your might, you are going to come out much further ahead. And black people, I speak to you too. I love you. I'm one of you. But we can be some cold-blooded racists too. Because we are able to say a white person is this or a white person is that or a Karen is this or a Karen is that, you think that it's right. But you're not pe peeling back the layers and looking at that person's intention, looking at their heart. You know, Annie has dedicated her life to researching this and writing books about it, to sharing her experience. Uh, and you can go somewhere, you you know, I don't care what you say, you still can't use the N-word, but you can go somewhere and someone can look at you and say, oh, you know, who who is this white woman? Who does she think that she is? And 
you have more love for us than a lot of times we have for ourselves. So again, brains, just kind of dial back, get to know. You know, I will tell you that when I was writing my first book, I had a couple people who were telling me, you know, just be prepared that you're going to get criticized because, you know, you're a white woman and, you know, you're writing about race and, you know, there's going to be eye rolls and, oh yeah, another white woman is hero kind of thing. And, you know, I just, I didn't listen to that. I kept doing it and I wrote my story and I've had so many black people reach out to me with appreciation that it's been unbelievably gratifying. I mean, like no amount of money is worth the amount of love that I've been given just because, because from black readers who just so appreciate a white person who's like an ally who stands up and who wants to speak out because, uh, and nobody's been rolling their eyes to me. Um, you know, there may be some eye rolling behind behind my back. I don't know, but I suspect if anything, it would be some white people who think that they, you know, but not black people have been wonderful and really um, just reach well, out. I'm to glad that we embrace you because they are two dynamic stories. They really, really are. So you're going to uh, grace us with a reading. Which book are you going to read from? I, I've been trying to decide what to read. I was going back and forth. Um, you know, and I finally, and then I, 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 there's both of my books have like the love stuff. And then they also have like the scary suspenseful stuff. And it's kind of hard to decide what to read, but, um, I think I decided just, just for fun, I'm going to read about, um, a, a scene actually with the brother in this book. Okay. And I just want to give a little bit of background of what this book is about and, and why I'm reading this section. So. With this story, actually what I think I'll do is read the back cover copy because that's sort of just a very quick way to just give you an idea of what it's about and I won't get tongue tied. And I'm gonna have to change glasses because I'm kind of blind. And okay, that's all right. We're gonna get a reading brains from House of Fragile Dreams. So this is just the back cover copy to give you a little bit of um, background. Still recovering from a divorce and the death of her parents, Rachel is living in the large house she grew up in. Upon meeting an African-American veteran and his five-year-old son, she begins to hope for a new life. But when her estranged brother shows up demanding to move into her back cottage, he threatens to ruin everything. He's disturbed, gun obsessed, and as Rachel discovers, involved with people who threaten much more than her dream of a happy home. Addressing themes of love, hate, social fracturing, and violent white supremacy, House of Fragile Dreams is not just a suspenseful love story. It's a poignant reflection of a country in troubled times. Wow. So I just want to, so I'll set up this thing I'm going to read. So we've already met Rachel and Nate, and they're the, 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 the two main characters, and they get trapped together in an elevator and um, for a few hours. And, and Rachel's white, and we find out from the backstory that we sort of learn in this elevator, she's white, but she was raised by a Black stepfather. She has an older brother who's 10 years older than she is, and so his experience of the whole black stepfather thing was completely different because when Rachel was, um, when, when he entered, the, when the black stepfather entered Rachel's life, she was just a toddler. So for all intents and purposes, he was her father, he raised her, but her brother was a teenager when that happened. And he also already had kind of personality issues. So, you know, he, he, didn't, he didn't really like, like being moved out of his old neighborhood, moved in with this new father and all this kind of stuff. So he had a very different experience in the family and the two of them are um, now extremely estranged. They inherited the, the parents' house together because the parents both died fairly early. They inherited the house and Rachel brought, bought out um, Dan, that's her brother's name, Dan's share of the house. So, but then he went out and left, lost the money. He just squandered it in a stupid way that he would never admit to why, what happened, but he, he lost the money. So now she's in the house and he's bitter. In the meantime, he's become very sort of radicalized because I really wanted to write about this, all this political fracturing that's going on right now with, with, the, with the different sides hating each other. And Rachel's a liberal and her brother is right-wing extremist. And so that's another thing that's really fractured the two of them. So when Rachel met Nate, he told her he's living, he's living with his mother in Compton. He's studying for a degree in engineering. Um, in the meantime, he's living with his mother um, in Compton with his son. He's got this cute little boy named Isaiah, who, who Rachel's also kind of in love with because she's divorced and she had lost a baby in childbirth. So she's sort of in love with both Nate and, and the little boy. So she's thinking that maybe she's going to offer Nate to move into the back cottage, this before they get romantically involved, of her house because 
he was mentioning he wanted to get, you know, Isaiah into a better school district and she has this place and she thought, well, she'll offer to him. Um, in the meantime, the brother comes and he, he wants to move into the cottage and she does not want to have anything to do with her brother because her brother means just nothing but trouble. So, so she hasn't talked to him for a long time, but all of a sudden he's contacted her. He wants to move into the cottage. And this, this scene that I'm going to read is a scene where it's the first time she's, we, we meet the brother. She was in a restaurant with this guy named Craig having a, having a dinner when her neighbor called her and told her, uh oh, you know, your brother's, you know, milling around your house and it looks like trouble. So when she goes home, she sees her brother um, in the driveway. And this is what I'm going to read. The instant I saw Dan's truck, my resolve about how to deal with him wavered. I knew what I wanted to do, but it was hard to turn my back on him completely, especially knowing what my mother would want. I would not let him move in. On that, I was firm. But maybe I could give him some money or help him find a place to live if that's what he needed. At the very least, I would try to remain calm and not be drawn into a battle. Dan was in the driveway, so I parked in front of the house. I waited for him to emerge from his truck, but he didn't move. I got out of my car and approached him, thinking maybe he was asleep. He was, with his head back and mouth wide open, he looked like a fish on a hook. <laughs> I expected to see him surrounded by empty beer cans, but I only saw one, which is a relief although there were some duffel bags in the cab with him. For all I knew, they were filled with empties. In any case, I decided not to wake him and quietly entered my house, hoping I'd get lucky and he'd stay in the truck all night. Once I was inside, I debated whether to text Craig or wait. Anything could still happen. I decided to go ahead. What could he really do anyway? I texted him, home safe, so far so good. I immediately got back a thumbs up emoji, followed by have a great night, talk to you soon. Just seconds after reading his message, I heard three sharp knocks on the door at the front, three, three sharp knocks on the front door. I wasn't going to get lucky after all. I took some deep breaths and tried to brace myself for whatever was coming. Dan pounded some more and now he was calling my name. Starting for the door, I could hear my mother's voice. Be patient with him, your brother, Rachel, he needs you. I pulled open the door and Dan immediately rushed in, not waiting to be invited. It's about time, he complained. I've been out there for hours. I was out for dinner, I said, reminding myself to control my temper. He headed for the kitchen, first craning his neck to peer into the living room, looking for what, I don't know. I figured he'd go straight to the refrigerator, and he did. What have you got to eat, he demanded. I'm starving. Go ahead and make yourself a sandwich, I said. You know where to find everything. He began pulling items from the refrigerator, and I couldn't help but feel pity for him. He had several days growth of beard and now looked like, he'd, and looked like he'd slept in his clothes for a week. I wondered if he'd been sleeping in his truck. Do you want to take a shower, I asked, noticing that he also smelled bad. If you want to, you can take a shower and I'll make you a sandwich. I can also wash your clothes if you want to. I can give you a robe to wear until they're dry. Can I have some of this, he asked, holding up a bottle of wine. Help yourself, I said, resigning now to him spending at least one night. I wasn't crazy about him drinking, but I didn't want to argue with him either. Just don't drink all of it if you don't mind, I added. That's my last bottle of white. I pulled two glasses from a cupboard and put them on the island in the center of the kitchen. Pour me one too, I said, but then seriously, go take a shower, you stink. He gave him a sour look then poured a huge glass of fruit for himself, not bothering with the one for me. Afterwards, he headed for the hallway. Use the downstairs shower, I called after him. There are clean towels in there and if you throw your clothes outside the door, I'll put them in the washer and get you a robe. Fine, he hollered back. Then he treated me to, man, do I have to take a vicious shit. Seconds later, I heard the bathroom door bang shut. I poured myself a glass of wine and sank into a chair by the kitchen table. <clears throat> I knew I was being too nice, but I wanted to at least try to be a good sister. Hearing the squeal of the shower turning on, I chuckled nervously and shook my head. Then I raised my glass and took a drink of wine, praying things wouldn't go to hell, but knowing they probably would. Around 11 o'clock, <clears throat> Dan finally emerged from the bathroom, now clean shaven, with his dark hair combed back and still wet. His outgrown haircut was heading towards a mullet and he had a noticeable beer belly, but with our father's olive skin and light brown eyes, he wasn't bad looking, but he wasn't wearing a sneer. You look almost civilized, I said, as he arrived barefoot in the kitchen, carrying his empty wine glass. My robe was short on him, reminding me that my mother had sometimes called him chicken legs. The description still fit. He sat down at the table in front of the sandwich I'd made him and immediately began eating. So what's going on, I asked, what happened? 
<clears throat> he swallowed a big bite and <clears throat> picked up his empty glass. Can I have more wine? I pulled the wine from the refrigerator and filled, <clears throat> excuse me, half his glass, then sat down across the table from him. So come on, I said, what happened? I knew he'd never tell me what happened to his money. That was a taboo subject. But the last I'd heard, he'd at least had a job. He was some kind of mid-level manager at a Home Depot. His face took on a pained expression and I could see how hard it was for him to come to me in defeat. Did you lose your job? No, I didn't lose my job. He said, I quit. And I know what you're gonna say, so don't say it. He picked a piece of lettuce out of, his, out of his teeth. I did have another job lined up before I quit, but it fell through at the last moment. So now I'm screwed. Have you filed for unemployment? I can't get unemployment because I quit, he answered, his voice rising. You only get unemployment if you're laid off, which is fucked up, but that's the way it works. Well, if you talk to Home Depot, maybe they'll let you come back. There's no way I'm going crawling back to Homo Depot, he said with contempt. I thought you liked that job, I said. What happened? I don't want to talk about it. Let's just say I needed to get the fuck out of there. How long has it been since you quit? I don't know, he said, a few weeks. He took a bite of the sandwich, then went on with his mouth still full. I'm going to find something. Don't worry. I might even go to Idaho. I'm sick of fucking California. But I moved out of my apartment, so I need to stay here for a while until I figure out what to do. He swallowed and then burped. Your neighbor said no one's living in the back. What you told me was bullshit. My heart started to race and I wasn't sure what to do. I knew without a doubt that if I let him move in, it would be impossible to get him out and he'd make my life a living hell. It's what he did. It's what he did. Mother or no mother, I had to hold my ground. Wow. With William backing me up, William is her black stepfather who she kind of like thinks about in his pain or imagination has conversations with. With William backing me up, I came back with a lie. I've already promised it to someone else. I'm sorry. I could see he was ready to erupt. So I quickly added, I can give you some money to help you get by for a while. Maybe you can use it to move. I held my breath silently rejoicing at the prospect of Idaho. He didn't say anything, but his expression remained hostile. Reluctantly, I added some leaves to the olive branch. You can sleep in the guest room tonight and maybe another night or so, but you, I'm, but you need to find somewhere else to stay after that. I'm sorry. Oh, it's the guest room now, is it? Look, Dan, I said, I don't know what else to tell you. His face was turning red and I realized I really was afraid of him, which made me even more determined to stand my ground. Veins were starting to pop out and pulse on the side of his head. Please, I added, you know, you and I both know that you living here will not work. Won't work for who, he shouted, spraying spittle-laced mayonnaise across the table. I'd be just fine living out back. I'm not gonna cramp your perfect little lefty lifestyle. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand and glared at me. If mom were here, she'd think you were a selfish bitch. You know damn well I'm entitled to part of this house. You fucking robbed me. Now I regretted I'd offered him anything, but I was determined not to engage in a screaming match. I'm not gonna fight with you about the house anymore, I said un as unemotionally as I could. I'm finished with that. And after the phone messages you left me, I should be finished with you too. I stood up. Since you're here, you can stay the night. But tomorrow you need to leave. Move to Idaho. I think that's a perfect place for you. I turned and headed for the door, my heart racing. I'm going to bed. If you want to watch TV or whatever, that's fine. Just keep it low. Not waiting for a response, I left the kitchen and went upstairs to my room. I braced myself for some kind of scary aftermath, but the only sound I heard was the television. Thankful. Thankful for at least that, I locked my door and went to bed, but I couldn't sleep or stop my mind from spinning. I lay awake most of the night, worried about the cottage and praying for Idaho. Wow. So that's the brother. She's got her hands full. Now, now I can't wait. Now, you know, I might have to switch up what I was doing because I want to find out what's going on. That brother is troubled. He's yeah. going to get, he's going to, he's definitely trouble and as things heat up. Nate's going to get, you know, kind of pulled into something that's going to get him in trouble, which he does not deserve. So, no, but you know, that's what happens. So, um, have you done this in an audio version? Cause you got a beautiful reading voice. Have you done audio? No, my voice is awful. Um, I'd love to have it someday, but you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. It's definitely not out on audio yet, but I do. I love audiobooks myself. So it would be I do too, you know, cause you can multitask. <laughs> so fiction writing, did you work with a writing coach? No, um, I'm not really. I mean, I've been kind of writing my whole life. Um, when I first graduated from college, I actually wrote a book about Berkeley that um, as a college, well, I, I did it as an independent study um, when I was in the anthropology department at UC Berkeley and I sold it. It was called Berkeley USA, which was an interview of 
a book of interviews of um, Berkeley people. So I actually, you know, produced that book in my early 20s and I became a small publisher and I did some other stuff just kind of on a small level. Um, but eventually I, I started doing technical writing and I've kind of had this whole long career as, as a technical writer. But I've also done some books. You know, you have to be editing. pretty smart to be a technical writer because you've got to get into the nano details of what these people are trying to coach, deliver, sell, pitch to other people. So you're pretty heady. So to go from technical writing to fictional writing, I'm sure that was quite a journey, but it's something that was very freeing and allowed your creativity to shine. Wouldn't you agree? You know, I think the thing about technical writing, I mean, it's it, a couple of things. First of all, you know, it's been, it, I've made a good living as a technical writer and I've actually enjoyed it to some extent, mainly because of, I've enjoyed with pe the people that I've worked with. And it's, even though it sounds pretty boring, it can be pretty creative. But, but it gave me a lot of discipline as a writer. I've had to just crank stuff out. And sometimes the things I've been asked to do were kind of scary, but I've always had to like, it was a job. So I had to figure out how to do it. So when, um, but eventually I kind of felt guilty that I had such a kind of a, a, a career that didn't really do anything for the world, didn't, didn't really contribute anything meaningful. And so when I, so I've been, so a few, uh, maybe 15 years ago or so, I started doing creative writing just to have a more creative outlet and to try to figure out a way to sort of, you know, put my energy into something more meaningful. Um, and then eventually I, you know, started doing the novel writing, but, um, but I think that my discipline as a writer, um, just from technical writing and some other stuff that I did when I was younger in the, in book editing um, in Berkeley, um, gave me a lot of the tools that I needed to, right. you know, to start writing. So it's one thing to be a writer. It's another thing to be a reader. People aren't reading like they used to. Again, they're going to audio books. They're not uh, like me. After I do this with you, it's raining today and I'm so excited and I'm going to curl up and I'm going to read a couple chapters of that. And then I'm going to pick up a couple of chapters of, uh, of your book because it's really captivating. And they're two totally different spectrums. But then after that, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to listen to an audio book on health and wellness. People read for information. They read for relaxation. They read to transport them. How do we encourage children to go back to reading again? What, what, what are some of your suggestions? I mean, I think you have to start reading with children when they're really young. Right? That's like hugely important. I think we all understand that, that, you know, reading with kids is, is great. Um, I mean, it's a tough sell. A lot of kids don't, don't read very much. My, I've got two sons and neither one of them read that much. I mean, I would, you know, love to be able to say that my kids always have their nose in the book, but you know, they grew up in a time when there were video games and there were other things, even though we didn't really let them do video games when they were younger, um, they managed to do them anyway at their friends' houses and things like that. But, um, you know, a lot of people just grow up just not doing that much reading. I think Harry Potter, if, if you know, was really a good thing to get some kids really involved in the reading. My kids both, both read those books. But, um, you know, with so much content now and other things pulling on people's attention, it's a tough sell. But I mean, there's still there still are a lot of readers. And thank God for women's book clubs. And, yeah. um, you know, yeah, I think we'll always clubs. have readers. There'll just always be people that are, you know, who it, it appeals to them to read books. But it's true that I think that there are now like, you know, a smaller pool of people reading books. And there's also, I think, a larger um, pool of people writing books because it's become um, now because Amazon has made it so easy for independent um, writers to publish their own works and not have to, you know, have a have an agent or a publisher. There's there's a lot more um, opportunity to put books out. So there's a lot of books, fewer readers, but. Um, so what you know. are you doing to push through your book sales? And then it's great to write. <laughs> I mean, really, as well, you're doing podcasts. Thank you very much. Uh, but there are a lot of people out there that have a bunch of books looking back at them, pushing through. What are I some mean, of the things that you've done to, you know, to encourage sales, to get, to get this, these amazing books, these two right here, Brains, in your hands? How, you know, honestly, you the marketing part is not my forte. I mean, I know that I should be doing more. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about it. I wish that I could do some in-person things. I mean, the pandemic has is, is kind of made it difficult for people to go out there and promote their books and have book signing events and that kind of stuff. Oh, no. I'm Let me give you some suggestions. Brains, take notes. I've sold over 20,000 copies of my little tiny books 
uh, where, where is my book? I got my books here somewhere. Um, and I've been selling them since 2004. So a couple things. Donate your books to local libraries. Okay, that's an incentive. Have an online book signing. Encourage people to buy your book. Give them a bookmarker. Intimate groups. Start book clubs. The first book they read is yours. Um, also, get one of those uh, little, like the little birdhouses that they have where you exchange books. Oh, right. The, the little uh, libraries out the little li I love those. There's one right in front of my grocery store, a little local uh, community grocery store. It's the one right there. Um, you know, have offers. Uh, always have your book right next to your pretty face. Always have it up. Have it in the trunk of your car. Encourage people. Have a sale. Do a relaunch. Do a second edition. We well, you know it's kind of tough because there's a fine line between promoting your book and being annoying. Like, you know, like, it, you know, like I do Facebook, right? And I do a certain amount well, of if you're, Facebook. If you're still but, grabbing the same fruit, you got to, you got to expand. You got to go to different groups. You've got to encourage if people believe in you and what you do, they will say, hey, you know, check this book out, share this with my friend. You don't have to recycle it to the same people because it does get annoying after a while. You know, one of the one of the ways that I've done the best actually for for book sales is um is the Kindle library. There's like a like a library subscription that, that people who have Kindles can sign up for. I, I don't know, but it's like maybe ten bucks a month or something like that. And then you can read anything that you want from the Kindle library. And um, in Arkansas summer in particular is done pretty well in the Kindle library. And you can see every day you can see if somebody's reading because you see like this like graph that goes up. You get paid every time somebody turns a page. So, you know, on a daily basis, literally how many pages have been turned. And it's kind of fun to go, oh, my God, I got like 800 pages today or whatever, yeah. you know. I mean, I wish it was like 10,000 pages, but, you know, it keeps people steadily reading um, uh, from the library. So that's kind of a nice Thing. But yeah, I mean, Amazon ads, I mean, there are things you can do. And I mean, there are things you can like do. Amazon and ads. don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Again, if they are still selling the Bible, the Quran, and the Torah, they can still sell House of Fragile Dreams. Okay? The other thing too, they always say that, that if you want to sell your earlier books, just keep writing books. So I'm working on another one now. Um, I'm hooked. You know, I'm, I'm hooked as a, as a novel writer. And I'll just keep cranking them out. And one of these days, maybe, you know, I'll hit it big. You never know, or at least reasonably no. big. I don't and have any grand illusions people, about being a best-selling writer, but, you know. Well, you have to manifest it, honey. If you really want it, you have to speak into fruition. The universe doesn't know what you want until you tell it. And I can definitely see that. I can see your compassion. I can see your heart. I can see uh, the love that you have, not just for yourself, but for humanity, for men and women. And we love you uh, in the black and white community, you know. We love you in the in those shades of gray because that's where we all should aspire to be is somewhere in the middle. So thank you for being here on the edge with me and my brains, Annie. Tell my brains thank how to get so in contact much. with you and how to purchase a copy of your books. Did you say I didn't hit? You say do you want me to tell how to contact me? Oh, absolutely. How do they get a contact? A signed copy from you or Amazon? Let, let me know. Well, I'm on Facebook and I, I also have. Um, uh, you know, email that people can write me if they want to. It would be moose.annie at yahoo.com. My book is available. My books are available not only on Amazon, but, you know, if you Google me, then you'll, they come up on, you know, Walmart, Target, all kinds of, you know, different outlets that you can get online. And, um, you know, friend me on Facebook. Uh, I don't friend do any of the follower. other social media yet, you know. Friend her, follower, leave her wonderful, inspiring, positive uh comments and, and i love to hear from readers i mean i i love when people reach out to me and tell me that they i had this one reader who she 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 loved my book and she started sending me jewelry that she made like she just wanted to express her appreciation oh, wow. and she sent me a scarf she said you know i mean it's just kind of nice when somebody that you don't know resonates so much with something you've done that they want to reach out and express gratitude and that kind of thing you know it means a lot to me um so yeah i, I encourage anybody who's read anything i've written or who has anything to say to me or um wants to connect with me to to reach out all right brains you heard that there is an invitation to love thank you thank so you much so again much. annie for being on the edge come back keep me posted on all the updates on the books and uh i'm looking to start a book club actually Probably the month of May, because April's really busy. 
And I think uh, I found one of our first books we're going to read. Oh, that would be wonderful. And I love to join book clubs. I've been, I've, I've, I sometimes even travel just to just to be in a book club meeting and um, I've done some Zoom stuff. I've, I've done stuff in New Hampshire. I've done stuff in Sacramento. I've done stuff, stuff in Sedona. And I get a kick out of going to meetings of, of ladies, you know, talking about my books and um, and they tend to spark interesting conversations because of the, the social. There's so much social content and issues in the books that bring up other people's experiences that we always right. have really excellent conversations right right well thank you so much again for being here on the edge brains do what you need to do please like love share subscribe and pick up a book and read thanks annie thank you it's been a great pleasure and an honor all right bye brains bye.